Uh, but I really actually do love these people. I think they're, for the most part, very smart, they're ethical, uh, and they actually know what the right thing to do is most of the time. When you ask them what to do, if they like, pick A or B, they almost always pick the right answer. Uh, so they, they instinctively get the right, uh, the, they understand uh, what to do. So, like people like uh, Daniel Bedditz, David Ross, uh, Katie, <clears throat> these people, if you happen to see them around or, or run into them or whatever, um, buy them a beer, you know, give them hugs. They're awesome people. I actually really, really like these people a lot. Um, I mean them absolutely no disrespect, even though I am uh, constantly bugging them. Um, so, but I will argue that they cannot be successful at doing their job, uh, given the types of companies that they run and the ecosystem that we currently work within. So. I have to ask the question, and I think you should ask it of yourselves, like, why are you here? And I don't mean, like, at this particular convention, necessarily. I mean in this industry. Like, how did you get here? Why are you here? Um, are you doing it for fame or money? You know, what, what's the reason you're doing it? Are you doing it to protect people? Um, so Jeremiah Grossman, uh, CTO of our company, is uh, one of my best friends. And uh, he and I have kind of always just wanted to help uh, fix all this stuff that we see broken. Um, and I think that sort of drives us to do certain things and take certain uh, paths in life. But if you want to make the biggest impact in security, you really have to focus on the biggest hits, right? The, the, the most important places you can fix, the, the, the choke points on the internet. So things like browsers, uh, languages, operating systems, networks, um, you know, mobile devices, th those are the big choke points we've got on the internet. If we can fix those things, you literally, in browser's case, you can actually impact 2.4 billion people on the planet. So I'm not talking about small decisions here. This, this actually affects every single person you've ever met. Um, so, Here's the scope of the problem. So we have around 2.4 billion people on the internet right now. That's, that's not the entire population of the world, not by a long shot, but it's a lot of the earth. Um, we have about 40, uh, sorry, 84 to 90 percent, I'll, I'll show you these numbers and how I got them later, but um, of the internet uh, say that they want privacy. So that's, uh, if you ask them, this is self-selected, so this number is a little, a little skewed or whatever, but, but you, you can get my, get my drift, right? Uh, so that's 2.16 billion people um, or so of the 2.4 billion people who want privacy. Um, within that group, there's probably millions of people that we can directly impact in our daily lives that we can uh, reach out to through the press or whatever. We can somehow impact and change their lives in some way. So uh, a smaller percentage, we don't know that number because it's, uh, it's, it changes all the time really, but, uh, but you get my point. And then if you look at people who actively go, uh, NoScript is a good example of a technology that a lot of people use to protect themselves. Um, there's 1.9 million users of NoScript. So uh, the actual scope of changes that we've been able to affect with the given technologies is very, very small compared to the size of the ecosystem. Um, so we know things like NoScript do not work for the ecosystem. They work great for me, but great for the people in this audience, but they do not work for our parents or grandparents, that kind of stuff. So I thought this quote was really great. Uh, like I said, I actually like the people that works at these companies. So um, some of these quotes are actually um, uh, nice. Uh, different people want different experiences and are going to choose their browser based on that preference. And this is, comes from Mozilla. Um, I think that's really accurate. Um, this is sort of a, a diagram I wrote uh, to kind of try to explain to people what the differences between browsers could be. So the blue, the dark blue triangle in the middle uh, is sort of what your browser, as it comes out of the box, this is what it's sort of pre-configured to do, right? Uh, day one, you get this. The darker blue, or sorry, lighter blue blocks, uh, or triangle rather, that's around it, is sort of what you can extend your browser to be able to do with plugins, add-ons, extensions, uh, configuration changes, network, all this other stuff, uh, inline devices, and so on. These are all the other things you can make your browser do. The yellow triangle on the bottom is possibly what a consumer might want. Um, they don't really care as much about the security aspects uh, in terms of actually actively doing anything about it, but they really, they'll go out of their way to get extra features. Uh, they want more uh, functionality and they want more usability. Not necessarily the same or as deep uh, a functionality as a guy like me or people in this room might want. You might want to be able to do all kinds of crazy things, be able to change CSS on the fly, and all this kind of crazy extra functionality, not necessarily usability. It doesn't make it easy to use, it makes it more functional. Uh, and a guy like me obviously wants a lot more security. I'll extend my browser far beyond its normal reach. Uh, I won't necessarily turn everything off that I could turn off, but I'll turn off almost everything I could turn off because uh, I do still want to do some stuff. Um, wow, the slide got messed up. Uh, this is what happens when you convert from uh, Mac to, uh, to Windows. But <clears throat> So Google uh, <laughs> there. Um, 
this is a this is a diagram of what the sort of the different actors in the space sort of want out of the browser ecosystem. So Google primarily wants higher ad spend. That's the fundamental thing that they want out uh, out of the ecosystem. They want to increase the amount of ads uh, and increase the value of those ads. Um, advertisers they primarily want high conversion rates, lower cost per click. Uh, higher click-through ratios and ultimately a return on investment. Uh, they want to make money, uh, you know, selling you T-shirts or whatever, right? So the thing that they share in common, the thing that they both have in common, is monetizing users. That is that is something that they have in common. It's not something that users want. It's something that those two those two groups want. Users, if you just look, if you self-select, uh, primarily they want privacy and security is the fundamental lowest thing on the uh, thing that they have that's distinctive. Uh, if you look at what they share with advertisers, they want quality products. They want better t-shirts. They want uh, better colognes and whatever, right? The things they consume. The things that they share with Google, they, they primarily want uh, better search results. Uh, they want to see, um, you know, when they're searching for t-shirts, they want the high quality t-shirts on top. They don't want a scam store, right? Uh, and the only thing that all three groups have in common is performance. They all want faster performance. They want speed out of their browser uh, that allows you to spend more, allows you to transact more, allows you to see more of the internet in a shorter amount of time, and it's less sort of awful user experience. So, uh, so different actors, different needs, different things that they're trying to get out of this ecosystem. <clears throat> so. This is a good example of where, uh, like, people don't understand the advertisers and Google are not in lockstep. Uh, they actually do have different needs out of this. So uh, this is somebody's website, uh, and there's ads on there. Uh, and on one of the ads is an ad for Google uh, to sign up and get ads uh, and put it on your website. So effectively, by showing this ad, they're more or less telling a user of this site, you should get in the business of putting up websites and putting ads on the internet. Uh, which is sort of doesn't really help this person, right? This person uh, doesn't necessarily get any benefit. In fact, they might actually get less benefit because you might be interested in the same thing they are. You might get in a competing business and actually hurt their market more or less. So uh, they're definitely not in lockstep from a from a incentive perspective. So my goal, um, you always have to start with a goal, um, is to have a more private browser. But basically, I want to protect the sensitive information that's on my computer. I have a lot of people, other people's secrets. I've got my own secrets. Um, and if you say you don't have secrets, uh, I'm not going to trust you with secrets. Um, so my personal path to that goal is a little bit different than most people's. Um, um, everything that I do has to have at least two um, sort of methods of protecting ourselves because any one could theoretically break, right? Um, we could have find an exploit in one, but it's much harder to chain vulnerabilities together. Uh, it makes it almost almost impossible, not impossible, but nearly impossible. Um, so lately, as of just this past Snowden thing, um, I've been getting the question, why shouldn't you just down tell people to go use the Tor browser? Um, and the, the problem is the grandpa problem. Um, so uh, a while back, a couple years ago, um, there was this uh, problem where uh, Anonymous effectively uh, told uh, the world that they had uncovered 100 embassy passwords by um, having hacked uh, Tor exit nodes. Um, and why that's interesting is because it's exactly 100. It's not 101, it's not 96 or something, it's exactly 100. Uh, which means we know they have a lot more than that, which means that we know that uh, they're obviously looking at a lot more traffic than that. We know that uh, people are, have hacked uh, exit nodes. That's actually one of the, the best things about running an exit node is watching all the traffic. Um, so, so Grandpa, um, he might be interested in protecting himself, so he downloads a Tor browser. Uh, he sends sensitive information over HTTP instead of HTTPS because he's Grandpa and he doesn't know the difference between those two things. Uh, and effectively, the, the exit node steals that information and hacks poor Grandpa, and he no longer has a retirement, right? So there's a difference between anonymity and privacy. Uh, and it's a, it's a very slight distinction, but I think it's important to at least be aware or cognizant of the difference and why you cannot recommend Tor to people who don't know security, don't already very much understand the, the problem space. So let's say you want to submit a loan application. You really don't need to be anonymous. In fact, you really can't be anonymous. If you're trying to say, give me money, I, I have to know who I'm supposed to give you money to, right? So by ver the virtue of what you're doing, you cannot be anonymous. So there's no point in using Tor browser. Uh, but you might want to be private. You don't want anyone else to know that you want this money. You, maybe you don't want people to know that you don't have the money. You know what I mean? Um, 
Well, if you're surfing for legal as opposed to illegal uh, porn, for instance, maybe that's something you, uh, maybe you want anonymity for that. Maybe you do. Uh, let's say you uh, work in the press or something and you don't want people knowing you're that kind of person or what if, what if you're uh, a political person or something or whatever. You know, you get my, my drift. But you probably still want privacy. You don't want your mom to know what you're surfing in your spare time. Uh, if you're a political dissident, on the other hand, you want both. Uh, you don't want anyone to know what you're doing. You don't want anyone to know your name. You don't, even your family cannot be trusted because you're putting them in harm's, in harm's way if they find out, right? So that's a, that's a good example of where Tor Browser would actually be a good, a good idea. Um, and then you have things like me researching presser cookers, because apparently that's now a bad thing to do. Um, uh, so I may want an anonymity. I don't want anyone to know that I'm researching presser cookers, because they would just ask too many questions, and I don't want to deal with the hassle. Uh, but I don't really care about privacy. If my wife finds out that I'm searching for pressure cookers, who gives a crap, right? She knows that I just want a crock pot. Um, and I do want a crock pot. So, this, uh, this is what an average website looks like today. Um, I think a lot of people think of websites as very two-dimensional things. They are definitely not. The browser, the DOM, uh, is uh, very three-dimensional. It's got a z-axis. Uh, you have transparency stuff, so you can actually see through the DOM and actually look at multiple layers. Um, one of the things I thought was interesting about healthcare.gov, I actually bothered to look through the source code. I, that was a huge mistake. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, but um, but it has all these problems. It's, it's, uh, it's very three-dimensional, and there's no way for you to actually know what's going on at a given time without actually looking at what the DOM is doing in that moment. It's sourcing in too much JavaScript. There's no way for you to know exactly what's happening. You have a time of check, time of use issue. It's, it's just a total teardown. Uh, but every site is like that. It's not healthcare.gov. It's every site. Um, every modern site has this exact same sort of layout. So what am I willing to give up? Um, if I'm going to make a secure browser, what would I have to do to get there? And I, I, I have done this, so it's, it's a major pain in the butt. Uh, so firstly, I don't need anything to be fast. Uh, so unlike the normal consumer who is focused on speed and performance, I don't need that. I don't care about it. It's, uh, in fact, I think speed can actually kill you in a lot of cases because there's a lot of things that need to iterate in JavaScript, and the faster they can iterate, uh, the faster you get hacked. Um, I don't need bookmarks, autofill, prefetching, web slice gallery, whatever the hell that is, and a bunch of other stuff, right? I'm willing to get rid of all that stuff. It's all pointless from my perspective. I don't need any whiz-bang websites, you know, fly-ins or whatever, transitions and stuff. I'm willing to get rid of all that stuff. I, I'm really not interested in that. It doesn't actually uh, in, help me on the internet do what my, I need to do. Uh, and I really don't care about pop-ups or warnings, um, unless they're actually helpful, unless they actually uh, warn me of impending, irreversible danger. If they don't warn me about that, they're pointless and they're just getting my way. Uh, so the Internet Explorer has this amazingly stupid pop-up if you're trying to do, uh, make scripts run optionally. It's like, scripts are usually unsafe. Do you want to allow scripts? Which script? What are we talking about? Uh, so useless stuff like that. So there's a lot of enemies. If you're going to build it, you've got to focus on what the problem space are. So here's the problems, right? First thing, cross-domain. Anything cross-domain is a potential way you can get hacked. Uh, it's sourcing in remote JavaScript or pulling in an iframe or, or making a, a cross-domain request that could do uh, cross-site request forward, cross-site scripting, click checking, and so on, right? Um, so there's a bunch of different ways you can solve that. Uh, request policy is probably my favorite. Uh, it breaks all cross-domain requests. Uh, there are some caveats to that, and there are some ways to hack it. But for the most part, it's very good. Uh, if you've never used it, it's sort of like uh, no script on crack. It's just way, way worse. The entire internet breaks. It's pretty amazing. Uh, no script uh, is good for iframes. It doesn't really help with that much cross-domain stuff, with the exception of AVE, application boundary enforcement, which is very, very good. It stops all local RFC 1918 requests. Anything behind your corporate firewall will be protected. Uh, you can actually configure it and say, I don't want to be able to source in my bank from any other website other than when I just type it in. You know what I mean? Uh, port blocking, uh, this is something you typically do at the firewall level. You can do it at local uh, host-based firewalls, or you can do it in network-based. Uh, this can actually prevent a lot of the attacks. You can say, I'm only going to tunnel out to the internet. Don't allow my browser instance uh, from when this VM, for instance, to contact anything at local RFC 1918 or, or whatever, if you're using IPv6 or whatever. Um, removing credentials upon logout is actually very helpful because it, it limits what cross-site request forgery can do because you're, you're not logged in over time, right? So it does, if I log out very frequently, it's very less likely that opportunistic drive-by stuff is going to be able to impact a site that I've logged into since I don't have my cookies anymore. So that's nice. Uh, split horizon DNS, where applicable, there's some places that doesn't make sense. But typically, you should not allow the internet to see what your, your DNS looks like internally and vice versa. This, almost everybody gets this wrong. Uh, almost everyone hosts DNS on the same servers, too. So uh, 
That's bad for all kinds of reasons, by the way. <clears throat> so uh, command execution. Um, it's pretty obvious. I don't want people running stuff on my computer, right? Uh, this is typically what you think of as malware. Uh, so no script and quick Java. Uh, those are both great plugins. Uh, they limit what you can do in JavaScript space. Um, that's great. You optionally turn it on when you want it. It's, it's uh, really helpful. Uh, removing protocol handlers. Um, there's a whole mess load of protocol handlers that do all kinds of random things. Uh, that's actually one of the main vectors that a lot of malware gets in. Uh, so you just need to turn them to always ask, do, are you sure you want to run like the ITMS protocol from your website? Like I probably don't need to launch iTunes from my website. Uh, or at least let me know and I'll make the decision. Uh, click to play is actually probably one of the most useful features if used properly. Uh, it basically will say you don't run Java or you don't run ActiveX controls or you don't run whatever we're talking about, uh, Flash or whatever, unless you click this button and say, yes, I do want to allow it. Uh, so that limits uh, opportunistic drive-by pretty substantially. Uh, sandboxy, uh, I don't know if, has anyone ever heard of Sandboxy? That's a pretty cool tool. Yeah, if you haven't heard it, you should definitely check it out if you're on Windows. Uh, it's similar-ish to Sandbox-exec uh, or Jailkit if you're, similar, if you're familiar with those things. Uh, Windows 7 is great because they got ASLR in depth, uh, so it actually pre prevents a lot of the sort of memory corruption issues, figuring out where stuff is and pointing pointers off to the wrong location and so on. So go on Microsoft. That was great. Uh, they really improved up their game in Windows 7 over, over uh, previous versions. Uh, Windows 8 is crap, don't use it. Uh, BSD, uh, True to Jails, if you're not familiar with this, uh, it's very similar to Sandboxy, except a much lower level. Uh, there's only been one exploit in it in the history of the product, and it's been out there for like 10 years or something, so very, very solid. Um, similar, again, to Sandbox Exec and Gel Kit, if you're familiar with those things. Uh, antivirus, uh, a lot of people laugh about antivirus. I actually think antivirus does have a time and place if you have extra CPU and you don't really care about wasting your own power. Uh, but there is certain circumstances where antivirus has caught viruses, so you will get some incremental gain from doing that. Uh, Geely, or similar, something if you have F-Times, you're familiar with that, or uh, Tripwire is a commercial product. Uh, anybody who's modifying binaries, that would be a good thing to know. Uh, obviously, if someone's modifying your binaries without you knowing it, that's probably something bad. Uh, application whitelisting, content integrity monitoring, uh, there's a whole bunch of products out there that do this kind of stuff. Uh, Core Trace is one of the bigger ones. Um, actually, I think they just got bought. Uh, Lumension, I think, bought them. Uh, but anyway, that kind of thing, figuring out, uh, I, I only want to run these certain binaries uh, from the browser process. So this is what that ends up looking like. Uh, so uh, on the outside, you have PF, packet filter. Inside that, you have FreeBSD. That's rooting BSD true to jails. Inside that, you're, you're launching VirtualBox. Inside that, you have multiple uh, different, effectively, jails. Um, those um, can be your mail, for instance, your Outlook access, or wh whatever. Uh, and you have your browser. Uh, those are Windows 7 images. Inside those Windows 7 images, you have Sandboxy. Inside Sandboxy, you, you have a stripped down version of Firefox, and there you go, right? No memory corruption. You have to jump at so many hoops to get out into the parent operating system or into even, even into one of the subsequent uh, nearby jails. Makes it nearly impossible. So data exfiltration is the next one. Uh, data exfiltration is really gnarly. <laughs> if, I can, if you can take stuff out of my computer, steal stuff from me, that would be bad. So um, one thing that everyone gets wrong is disabling arrow transparency. They take screenshots, and you can still see what's going on behind there because there's transparency going on. I see this all the time. Uh, removing credentials upon logouts, uh, disabling anti-phishing and anti-malware support, which sounds like a bad thing from, a pre from the previous slide, but uh, there's reasons it phones home uh, every couple of hours. Uh, it phones home, depending on which browser you're using, Firefox and, Internet and, uh, and Chrome. Uh, Chrome also sends your machine ID and user ID to the Internet every five hours. Um, request policy, uh, I think, is much better than ad block uh, for the purpose of protecting your privacy and, and re removing what is exfiltrated out to third parties. Uh, but I think both uh, provide some value. Um, settings require plugins permissions, so this is similar to what I was talking about with uh, protocol handlers. Uh, just make sure that everything's always clicked to, uh, to alert you. Uh, Burp Suite uh, plus Wireshark and Process Explorer all show what's going on if, if stuff's making up on connections. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a tool, uh, what's it called? Uh, Little Snitch uh, in Mac, if you're familiar with that. It's very similar to that. Uh, 
Uh, Firefox has a great built-in ac um, uh, lack of access to res colon and file colon, so SMB protocol is removed, which is great. Um, they do have things like uh, Chrome colon and about colon and that kind of stuff, which is not as good, and I wish they didn't, but uh, they do. So, uh, so the more you can remove that, the better. Gold images upon reboot, make sure that nothing persists, so cookies and uh, flash cookies and all these other uh, persistence uh, items all just get removed upon reboot. Uh, and then Firefox also just recently fixed, uh, fixed the CSS history hack, and I think they also fixed the pixel perfect timing tack uh, just like last month. So man the middle, um, that's a pretty common one. I think we're all familiar with this one. Um, internal CAs instead of using VeriSign, gold images to remove temporary allowed certs. Um, if, if you ever use Burp Suite and you have to temporarily allow a cert, uh, you don't obviously want to keep that forever. Uh, standalone proxy support for Firefox. This can actually hurt you and help you depending on how you use it. Uh, if you use it properly, it can help you. If you use it improperly and just surf the internet wildly from a computer and don't willy-nilly and just use proxies, uh, this will get you killed because uh, it'll phone home through uh, and make ITMS protocols outside the proxy, and so that's not good. Uh, but, but if you use it properly and you limit your computer to only making calls out through uh, Tor, for instance, using Janus VM or something like that, uh, you, you can actually make that very secure. Uh, SSH and VPN tunnels, uh, preferably, like I said, everything has a backup, so you use both at once. Uh, there have been many issues in SSL over the years that allow uh, information leakage, uh, but there has been no issues in both at once. Uh, perspectives or SSL Elvis, uh, I like the concept of these tools. In practice, they're actually not very good. Um, I'm not going to go into all the reasons why. If you want to talk about it later, that's fine. But uh, so what about Burp Proxy? Burp Proxy uh, actually creates more problems in some ways than it, than it helps. Uh, you can actually chain Firefox with Burp Proxy through a local SSH tunnel and actually reduce uh, the bad things that Burp Proxy could theoretically be doing. Um, or uh, uh, use a VPN and, and, like I said, wrap it like Janus VM and make sure that everything is going out, out the, same, uh, the same tunnel directly. So if you're not familiar, uh, there actually are tools right now to do man-in-the-middle attacks uh, using SSL, which is why you should not be using SSL as your primary means of protection. Uh, it just doesn't work very well, and you have tools like this uh, from Packet Forensics where you upload the SSL cert for, you know, VeriSign or whatever, the root cert into this thing, and uh, basically they, they can man-in-the-middle any connection. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're using SSL or not. Uh, and they wouldn't build this if they weren't using it, by the way. So they're, they're doing well. Uh, so texting and pre-texting uh, pre and phishing are, are a kind of an oddball, but people care about this a lot, so it's worth talking about. There really are no good solutions. You can use stuff like OpenDNS if you trust them. Um, I kind of don't, uh, but uh, a lot of people really like them. Um, no script plus A plus request policy to, to, enable the, to disable the JavaScript, um, because there are some situations where super bait scenarios where they're pulling sourcing in JavaScript uh, on the target. So on eBay, for instance, they'll source in JavaScript for a remote page. It'll look like the sign-in page, but it won't be. Uh, so um, that's that's not really uh, it's not really a great solution, but it does fix super, super bait scenarios. And then in my case, education. I, I used, I'm a sort of a lifetime member of APWG. I used to work for eBay on the anti phishing team. Um, I've looked at literally thousands of phishing kits. Um, I, I really don't actually need to worry about phishing sites uh, personally. This is this is all personal, right? Uh, and I don't use passwords, uh, reuse passwords. So it's not really helpful for people to get my password because they, they can't use it anywhere else. So. Um, so I, I haven't totally solved this problem, but it's mostly solved because I, I'm me. Um, so, uh, so good on me, I guess. Uh, so this is sort of what it looks like. Um, no scripts uh, for cross-site scripting and clickjacking, application and boundary enforcement, which is great. Foxy proxy for the standalone fire, fire, uh, proxy support, which is great. Request policy is super awesome for cross-site request forgery issues. Eh, uh, there's some issues there, but not that bad. Clickjacking, some cross-site scripting is, uh, is fixed as well. Quick Java for redundancy with uh, with no script. Uh, I actually really like that tool a lot. I, I actually don't download it nearly as often as I should on my sh machine. And I don't think you really should pay a whole lot of attention to perspectives uh, because, like I said, it doesn't work for the reasons I haven't told you. Uh, but so that that's the scorched earth approach to browser security. If you wanted to be really secure, that's what your browser would look like. Uh, what does it look like to actually surf the internet? That is what CNN looks like in my browser. <laughs> Um, so, 
And, uh, you know, so people are like, well, why don't you just use links, right? Um, and the, uh, the problem with links, A, there's a buffer overflow in links, so. Uh, but B, even if there wasn't, I could wrap it and put it inside SIGWIN and put that inside of a sandboxy and on and on, right? I could do all the same things. But, uh, but the problem is um, I still want to be able to enable things when I need to enable them, and I can't do that in links. Links doesn't have all that functionality. So I need greater functionality than a links could possibly perform. Remember that triangle thing. Um, so let's shift focus a little bit towards ads. Um, and I know that, that that doesn't sound like it's related, but, but it's very, very, very related to this problem. So have you ever seen an ad? Yeah? This is apparently what websites look like this day. I don't, I don't ever see these things. But um, apparently this is what people have to deal with if they go to Baltimore Sun. Um, so uh, this is the first ad that ever existed. Uh, this is from AT&T. Um, it's in the early 80s. Uh, this is what started it all. Um, I thought this quote was really interesting. This comes from Vince Cerf, founder of the internet, um, not Al Gore. Um, he now works at Google. He said, we couldn't run our systems if everything in it were, per, uh, were encrypted because then we wouldn't know which ads to show you. So this is a system that was designed around a particular business model. So um, what this should have had is a dot, dot, dot because we want to track you, right? Um, that's, that's, what, that's the punchline of that, uh, that quote. Uh, and it's, I know it's a little tacky to quote someone you work with, but I thought this was really great that Jer said, uh, you get the smartest people in the world together, the best people this industry has to offer for the sole purpose of serving up ads, right? Um, so we're, we, we have this, uh, this monolith Google, which uh, is driven by a very different motive than, than you, a consumer, might be motivated by. Um, this graph is a little tricky to read, but basically, and uh, I, I can't remember where I got this. I think it was a Gallup poll, but, uh, but it turns out that people only slightly distrust hackers a little bit more than they distrust and actively will protect themselves from advertisers. Advertisers are nearly as bad in the public perception. And keep in mind, this is all self-selected surveys, so there is some bias. But it's, it's almost the same. People visualize advertisers and hackers and criminals as almost the same. Right? That is well above government spying on them, well above anything else happening. I thought that was really interesting. So why are they so bad? Why are ads so bad? Why do I care about ads? Um, first of all, they have viruses, right? The, the, they, there's very regularly um, threat post. Hey, I'm talking to you over there. <laughs> Uh, threat post will, will do these great posts on uh, malware being uh, spun out by various different ad networks. Uh, viruses, malwaretizing, um, people will say, hey, go download this awesome thing. You'll go down this awesome thing. It'll be something not awesome. Um, they waste a lot of time. On some pages, it can be 80% or more of the page weight. So if you care about performance, uh, whew, that is not helpful. <laughs> uh, definitely get a much higher performance out of removing ads. Uh, they're synonymous with tracking, which is, uh, I think, sort of the core of what I'm going to be talking about here. Um, people kind of half understand why that's bad. But uh, if you believe at all that people shouldn't track what you're doing as you go from page to page, you probably wouldn't like ads. They're often very offensive. Uh, I know this is a little small and hard to see, but, um, but this is a you know, meet Canadian singles or whatever. And this picture is actually of a Canadian woman who committed suicide, which is why she was in the newspaper. So this is an extraordinarily offensive ad, um, and uh, this is the most PG-rated non, uh, you know, offensive ad I could find. <laughs> but this is the kind of stuff that you see on the internet very regularly. So it's offensive women and children, or people who have, you know, sensibilities. Uh, I do not, but uh, you can. I'm sure some people. And they're also really obnoxious. Uh, they're really terrible. Um, you know, if you're trying to like pay attention to something and do something else, uh, and they're like moving around the screen and like catching. Your eye. I mean, they're trying to be as offensive as they possibly can. They're trying to get in your face. They're trying to get you to look at them. Uh, so this is something that they're aware of. Uh, the more they do, the more you'll click on it. Accidentally clicking on it, uh, purposely clicking on it, whatever. They don't care. Um, the size of the industry is not as small as I think a lot of people think it is. This is a many, many, many times over multi-billion dollar industry. So in 2013, we're looking at around $40 billion in the US alone. Uh, Industry-wide, it'll be closer to $100 billion a year, right? Um, this is an interesting graph, it comes from the IEB, so this is self-selected, uh, but in the sort of the bad way, self-selected, so this is actually really good data, uh, from the advertising industry. That, that belong to the IAB or that they can track. So we actually know the number's probably higher than that. Um, to put that in perspective, a lot of people were talking about the B2 stealth bomber program being a very expensive program. They could buy a B2 stealth program 
two times every year from now until the end of time, right? This is uh, every year. That's how much money we're talking about. Um, in fact, uh, Lockheed uh, is the eighth largest government uh, lobbyist in the world, followed by Google. Uh, sorry, Google is before them. They're, they're seven. So let's change topics a little bit to do not track. And this sounds like it's not related. These are all related topics, I promise. I'll get back to the, I'll explain why in a bit. Um, so the number one complaint I hear about do not track, the number one thing I hear everyone say is that IE10 doesn't follow the spec. Uh, they say it's useless because IE doesn't follow the spec. If they don't follow the spec, then we can't trust it and therefore we have to turn it off and all this kind of crazy nonsense, right? Uh, which you might not believe is crazy, but I'll tell you what. Um, so the number one thing everyone says, they don't follow the spec. All right, so does everyone know what Do Not Track is before I go any further? This is kind of important. No? Yes? How about I explain it? Uh, so Do Not Track basically sends a signal to websites that you do not want to be tracked. That's the simplest, most uh, you know, uh, PG-rated version I could possibly come up with. But it's, it, that's effectively what they're trying to do. How many states do you think Do Not Track has? Anyone? States. Three? Any other, any other comments? Two? That's it? Okay, okay two. Uh, it turns out there's three. There's three states. Um, but uh, not a whole lot of people know that. Uh, there's actually one state that says, do not track one. Uh, there's one state, that which means do not track me. There's one state that says, do not track zero. So it's like a double negative, like do not track me not. I guess, um, so if you like double negatives, that's great. Uh, and there's one state that says nothing, that just doesn't send the signal at all. Um, and so it turns out, uh, if you actually look at how browsers implement this, almost no one follows the spec properly, not just Internet Explorer. Uh, they all do something random. So this is what Internet Explorer does. Um, it's, it's turned on by default. Um, uh, and it's just one button. Uh, it says, do not track, and if you unselect it, it won't send the HTTP header. So they're not following the spec, everyone agrees, right? This is what Chrome does. Uh, they do not have it turned on. I have it turned off in the, I'll turn on this uh, screenshot, but uh, it's turned off by default, and uh, they have two settings. One, don't send the do not track signal, or two, send nothing. So they have no concept of do not track not, right? Um, this is Safari, which I never use, which is why it's uh, unselected here. Uh, but this is, uh, this again, two states. Uh, ask whether or not to track me or don't send a signal at all. And then Firefox. They're the only ones who are doing it right, um, or technically to the spec anyway. Um, they have three states. Uh, one that says, uh, tell, uh, tell sites I do not want to be tracked, which is do not track one. Tell sites that I want to be tracked, do not track zero, uh, do not track not. Uh, and lastly, do not tell sites anything about my tracking preferences. And the irony is, I actually talked with a security expert and I was like, uh, you make sure you turn that on. He's like, wait, which one is do not track on? I don't, I, because the phrasing is so bad here, it says do not tell sites anything. And so he, that's the part he read. He's like, okay, I don't want to tell sites anything. Like, just don't, don't track me at all, right? That's what he's thinking. So the, even the phrasing here is actually very bad. So uh, one would argue this is a, just a big hot mess, right? This whole thing is terrible. Um, so a lot of people say no one supports it. Well, that's not really true. Um, Yahoo, Pinterest, Twitter, they all sort of support it uh, with a mixed bag when it comes to Internet Explorer because they believe that Internet Explorer isn't doing it right because they're not following spec. Everyone else is doing it right apparently. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, but keep in mind, so this is again self-selected study, but uh, 84 to 90 percent of people want more privacy. Um, that's pretty awesome. Uh, you can do shadow puppets if you want. It's cool. Um, so True Effect was they, but they, uh, they made the news, which I thought was really really great actually, uh, uh, because it kind of shows an ecosystem in one small snippet. Basically, they said that because Internet Explorer has this on, and because Internet Explorer 10 is so prevalent, they're just going to say we're not going to support it at all for anybody, for any in any circumstance. Um, instead of just not using IE10 saying we, we just don't trust them, they're just like screw it, we're not gonna do it for anybody now. Uh, so that's kind of great, uh, that, that solves the problem, right? Uh, the tracking industry can keep going, doing what they're doing, uh, Do Not Track doesn't have any meat to it, uh, so this is awesome. So let's talk about how far away it is to turn this on, right? How many clicks does it take to get Do Not Track turned on? This is an indicator of how much work someone has to go through to enable their privacy, right? So Internet Explorer is technically seven. Uh, they have it turned on by default, though, so you don't have to do any work, so it's actually zero. Um, but uh, it would be seven normally. Firefox, you have to do five clicks. It's funny, I got in an argument with a guy, uh, privacy guy. He's like, no, it's three clicks. I'm like, no, it's five. <laughs> uh, it's too bad that they don't know how many clicks their own software takes. But um, 
Chrome is six. Uh, it takes six clicks to turn it on. Um, so that's, you, would, you would imagine that Chrome would have less people selecting it because it's one more step away as a kind of an exponential drop off every time you add an extra click. Safari is five. I don't actually have good stats on Safari, I apologize. Um, I have the stats I've got, but Safari takes five. So you'd imagine it'd be somewhere in the same neighborhood as Firefox. Although I, in practice, I actually think it'd be less just because it's a default browser and people tend to, who use default browsers tend not to make changes to their browsers. Um, so do not track is kind of interesting um, because it's not how the spec works, it's how people actually, how the browser companies use it. That's what's interesting. So what they're actually using it is do not track not and no signal at all are effectively the same thing. They're treating those things as identical, um, which is kind of interesting so, uh, for all kinds of reasons. But here are the numbers that I was able to get from the advertising industry themselves. Uh, I don't think they know who I am, uh, which is pretty awesome. But uh, so this is TrueFX numbers straight from them. They gave them to me, so I didn't change anything about them. Uh, IE10 is 86.46%, uh, which seems awfully low. Uh, Firefox is 19.27%, which seems about right. And that's actually right in the right ballpark. Chrome is at 2.85%. Again, I think that's right. Uh, the reason why I think IE10 is probably totally incorrect uh, is not because I think they're lying about the numbers. I think they, they honestly had no reason to lie to me. They didn't know what I was going to use this for. Um, but, uh, but the problem is uh, I think there, is a, there are so many robots clicking on ads and looking at ads from an impression basis to intentionally to defraud uh, click, fraud, uh, click agencies or uh, banner advertisers. Uh, for the purpose of decreasing their fraud ratios, uh, that I think that this is probably just how much fraud they actually are seeing, which is around 15%. Uh, but anyway, uh, so you can imagine, let's just pretend they're absolutely accurate, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna double, double think this. Let's just use these numbers as they are. This is what it actually looks like. So consumer preference is somewhere around 86, uh, self-selected again, 80, uh, 80, sorry, 87% if you average it out. Uh, and IE is n almost I exactly in parity with what we would expect to see if users had the ability to change their browser uh, in, a, in a way that made sense with their brain. Um, really, I have five minutes left? Man, I just burned through this thing. Um, so that means that IE uh, is the only one that is actually in parity with what customers actually want, what people actually want. Um, and so we see ad blocking uh, basically uh, across the board. Uh, it makes sense. I mean, Firefox is always going to be the largest because uh, they make it the easiest. Uh, Chrome is going to uh, is just sort of a newer browser, so they're kind of coming out with a lot of the same software. So there's sort of an ad war coming. I mean, first we had ads, then we had uh, AdBlock Plus, and they had 14.9 million user, active users. Uh, then the ad agencies started paying off AdBlock Plus. Uh, they're paying them uh, quite a bit of money. We don't know the actual amounts. Uh, to allow ads to go through Adblock Plus, which means you can't trust Adblock Plus anymore. Then Congress gets involved and submits a letter to say, uh, we don't want uh, Firefox to uh, block third-party cookies because the children, uh, at Am they, don't, they think Amber Alerts are somehow gonna get blocked because cookies somehow turn off JavaScript or something. It's this bizarre thing. Anyway, it's totally, in factually totally incorrect, but whatever. Um, and because they're getting payoffs from the IAB, um, it, it, I thought this would be a lot more, but they're only getting paid uh, several thousand dollars. This doesn't count whatever Google's paying them directly. Um, so uh, that's why we sort of have this sort of browser ecosystem. Um, so remember, Google has $40, million, $40 billion uh, um, alone. Um, forget, forget uh, man, I've been spilling Google all day. Googe. Uh, <laughs> um, but a lot of people think, well, I use Firefox, so I'm not worried about this, right? Um, 98% of Firefox's revenue comes from search deals, of which uh, for, um, Google makes up 80 to 90 percent. I think it's around 88 percent of those deals. So the bulk of Firefox's revenue comes from ads. Um, this is last year's numbers. I think Google now has switched their numbers a little bit now that they got the mobility patent. So they're also a patent troll slash mobile provider as well. Um, so Google is paying um, Firefox a billion dollars every three years for this pleasure of uh, of being the primary search bar when you, ever, when you put that in the upper right hand corner or whatever. Um, so where are ads heading? They're heading towards this, this sort of not a great future where um, you're going to have a very select small set of tools like Disconnect that will win against most third party JavaScript ads, but not all. Um, sans some sort of set fast flux stuff. I mean, uh, ads are basically turned 
turning into viruses. Um, they're going to have they're going to have all the same sort of filter evasion, blacklist evasion type stuff that you see with viruses, just because they need to make money. Um, so advertisers will create local sourced ads like True Effect. That's exactly what they do uh, because that makes it much harder for a guy like me to block because it's all on the same page. You have to use heuristics or something terrible. Um, so then companies will increase blackmail tactics and say you have to enable JavaScript or you have to enable ads to see my website. We've already seen this kind of stuff. Then we see regulation via the FTC because consumers are get pissed and they're like, hey, we really do not want to be tracked anymore. You know, we're tired of this stuff, which is sort of bad and sort of good because you really don't want the FTC writing regulation because of Amber Alerts and children in Congress and whatever. Um, so Google will probably start suing us in the not too distant future. They're, they've already started attacking ad blockers directly. Uh, this is an example. They're prohibited actions, things you won't engage in this activity. You know, you're, we're going to take you down. And then they did. Uh, they actually started removing ad block from or ad block uh, like things from the uh, from the Chrome store. So. So what's the so what? So yes, do not track is a good example of sort of one interesting fact. It wasn't, wasn't good in of itself. It's a bad technology for all kinds of reasons, but it was good for tracking. It basically gave us the insights we need to know that opt-in security is a bad idea. Opt-out security is a good idea. Um, so we need to build technical controls that basically mirror that. Um, and that means that we have to support cannot track as opposed to do not track. Uh, do not track does not work. We have to say that we, we basically prohibit our browser from doing those bad things. Uh, and once advertisers learn how to play nice, then we can sort of revisit this thing uh, when they sort of haven't done that. So you shouldn't recommend my setup. You shouldn't recommend this horrible CNN world where you can't see anything but links and text, right? The, the, the links world. Uh, we need something better. We need something that's more substantial that actually works. Um, we need uh, something uh, that doesn't actually impinge on people's privacy, and we need something that isn't uh, sort of diametrically posed with what consumers actually want. Um, I was told that IE is concerned about lawsuits, for instance. Um, that's, that's a perfectly good reason to be concerned about it, so we probably shouldn't use IE because they're worried about lawsuits. Um, we want higher security uh, and privacy uh, tools as a percentage of the things that come down as opposed to um, other you know, privacy uh, tracking sort of things. That are built in the browser, and then ultimately we've got to side with the consumer because I mean those are our family members, right? Those are the people that you know we have to side with. Uh, they're the they're the most important people to protect, um, and they're always going to win this battle anyway. So what's White Hat doing? So we're in a, in a unique position where we have zero conflict of interest. We don't actually make money off of ads. We have no interest in tracking people. Um, it's sort of a unique position. Uh, we don't believe in this do not track concept. Um, we believe in cannot track by basically opting everybody out of security as opposed to opting them into security. Uh, you have to do stuff to turn off your security as opposed to do stuff to turn on security. Um, so we built this thing called Aviator. Um, you may have heard about it. It's Mac only. Uh, we're eventually going to be ma making it uh, available on Windows platform as well. Uh, but this is a, sort of our first salvo at trying to do what Chrome did. Chrome made the internet faster. We're going to try to make it a lot more secure and private. So I'm out of time. But thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate it.